The Senior Rehab Podcast is sponsored by Health IQ. Health IQ is a special rate life insurance company for health conscious people like you and me. If you're in the market for life insurance to have peace of mind and to protect your family, I'd highly recommend checking out this company. They are the only life insurance company to use data to leverage lower life insurance rates for active individuals. So the result is that 56% of Health IQ customers save between 4 to 33% on their life insurance premiums, which can definitely add up to big savings over time. To find out more information, just go to healthiq.com forward slash SRP to support the show and to get your free quote. Hit me. This is a senior rehab podcast, the podcast for rehab clinicians that want to better serve older adults. Hey there, Senior Rea Podcast listeners. I'm Tali Spaceman. I'm Erin Carey. And this is Senior Rea Project. How are we doing? Oh, I'm doing quite well. How are you? I'm good. I don't know if you heard, but this January, the UK appointed a Minister of Loneliness. Oh, how sad. It, when you think about it, it sounds really sad. It sounds like automatically you have a lot of Beatles and Smith song <laughs> in your head. The parliament appointed a Minister of Loneliness. It's actually a minister that will sit at the head of a committee about loneliness. There's a committee? There's a committee. <laughs> oh, that makes me sad. It somehow sounds sadder. <laughs> I belong to the Committee of Loneliness, <laughs> a group of people who come together and talk about how lonely they are. I am going to warn the listeners, <laughs> it might be a pretty sad episode. I Or hilarious. Or th- th- they are the same when you look at them. <laughs> but actually, a little bit of a background. So th- the UK has acknowledged that loneliness, especially at, at older ages, is a severe epidemic now. One out of 10 people report that they either often feel lonely or always feel lonely. Uh, One out of 10 people, like one out of 10 older people? No, one out of 10 people. Just all of them. All of them. 10%. And in older people, some about a little bit less than 30% has reported they talk to a relative or, or a friend once a month. What? Yes. Wait, that's not what I was expecting you to say. No, once a month. 30% of people. Uh, sorry, 20%. 20%. Still. It's so still like a lot. The 80, there are 80% of people in Britain that just don't talk to anyone more than once a month? No. The 80% talk to, they don't okay. count. The, like, the other 80%, it's not that scarce. Okay. That they count the amount of times that they talk to a relative or a friend. So one fifth of people in the UK, one fifth of older people, of older people in the UK, yeah, only talk to a friend or relative once a month. Mm-hmm. This is making my feelings hurt. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, it's going to be an episode with a lot of feelings, but the good feeling is that it's the first government to actually target that and say that listen, we have a problem, and it might sound mushy feely, but it actually affects somebody's health and it affects our health. And our resources, I'm going to get into what are actually the effect of on health. Good. And if I can do a little bit of more of the background, actually, it's a project that was started by uh, Joe Cox, which was a parliament member. Uh, she She's from the Labour Party. And it was her, kind of her baby when she ran to parliament. And she was actually murdered just before the Brexit. Wait. This is the minister on loneliness. The the it was the woman that wanted that to happen. That wanted the UK to acknowledge that they have a problem. Wow. She was a member of parliament, and she was just uh, murdered in a rally just before the Brexit. And uh, now members of the opposite party, members of the Conservative Party, especially Theresa May, who is the prime minister yeah. of the UK, said that this is a very important project and she would like it to continue. And she appointed a minister to deal with that. So I'm wow. I'm personally glad when politicians put whatever divide them aside in order to work for the society that they uh, lead. I think that's how it's supposed to work. Yes, and I shouldn't be that surprised and so <laughs> sentimental about it. <laughs> I think, well, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but that's really, 
that's really heartwarming. Yeah, it's it's heartwarming also that somebody's legacy is yeah. carrying on. Yeah. So for research, because because <laughs> I needed to cry over some paper. <laughs> <laughs> This one was published in 2015 okay. in Gerontology Journal. And uh, it's a review that assessed the status of research right now on loneliness and health in older adults. I took something from 2015 and people say eh, it's about like two, two years and two months a uh, little uh, older. But I think it's a good entry article for the whole thing of loneliness and I like when something kind of explained to me the anatomy and physiology of something before I go to details. Yeah. So I same. think it's... Um, Especially if it's a topic that I don't know a lot about. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's definitely helpful for that. Well, they're like, okay, I know some familiar words, but I don't want to assume. So it's uh, uh, it was a good article for that. The citations there are good. If you want to look more closely in the citations, do that. So they talk about the increasing evidence that suggests perceived social isolation or loneliness is a major risk factor for physical and mental illness in later life. Yep, that makes perfect sense. They reviewed and supplied information on five topics. A, the definition that distinguished loneliness from other related concepts like living alone, like social isolation, like solitude, because those words we kind of like think are in the same realm but they're not the same, and they don't have the same effect. Okay. They estimate the prevalence of loneliness in old age. They review the correlation and health effect of loneliness. Wait, wait, wait. wait. What do they estimate for the prevalence? Are you going to talk oh, about that later? Yeah, I'm going to talk about it later. Okay. It's somewhere between 24 and 34%. That makes me so sad. But I'm going to go into it uh, later. Okay. <laughs> and... um. <laughs> Do you want me to go into it now? Yeah, why not? Okay. So since you asked about the estimate of loneliness, they talk about something between 19 and 34 percent. Yeah, I know. It varies because of a lot of things. A, the measures of loneliness that are used, that I'll go into later, the population that is studied. Is it all the population? Is it older adults? Is it older adults in the community? And the age group and sample size. Okay. The AARP, which is the American Association of uh, Retired People, mm-hmm. talks about somewhere between 25, 29%. Wow. And they reviewed people over 70. Young and Victor. Uh, <laughs> oh, every now and then I'm going to stop because they're in size and I need to put my hand on her. I like need a minute. <laughs> Uh, Young and Victor compared estimates of loneliness in older adults in 25 European countries. Okay. Which was about 47,000 people. Wow. Yeah. Ironically, former communist states, people felt more lonely. And communists come from a community. (laughs) This is a sad, sad joke. (laughs) Communists. Uh, yeah, it was somewhere like in Ukraine, it was uh, 34. In Russia, it was 24.4. Oh. In Poland, it was 20.1. And Norwegians were 30.2 in another study. So when people ask you all the lonely people, where do they all come from? What are you going to answer? I'm going to say mostly Eastern European countries of communist origin. And yeah. other places. And I wouldn't be wrong. <laughs> you wouldn't be wrong. <laughs> oh. So since we did prevalence, do you want to talk a little bit about the measurements? Yeah. I'm wondering what they use to measure this. What are the psychometric properties? <laughs> so it's a sensitivity and specificity. <laughs> What's the gold standard of loneliness measurements? <laughs> I have a really good song title. Oh, yeah. How do you measure loneliness? Oh. Loneliness commonly measured either using single item, unidimensional scales, or multidimensional approaches. Okay, please. I tell will me specify. More yeah. So <laughs> the single item. Is, is you just ask people, do you feel lonely? It's a yes or no. It's a yes or no question. And I think that you assume what are the pros and what are the cons of just asking, do you feel lonely? Mm-hmm. The good thing is that it's a good survey question. If you want to do a research for 50,000 people. Yeah, it's quick, succinct. It's, it's quick. You're, you're more likely to get responses because it's so quick. The reason not to use it is that people sometimes don't answer because of the stigma. 
Mm. Like, if you ask me for a second, do you feel lonely? Do you feel lonely? What? No. Me lonely? No, you lonely. You're stupid. It's easy to use, but not everything that is easy to use is good to use. That's very true. Sporks. <laughs> Though it is, and everything that I'm t talking about is valid and reliable, but... Um, it better be, otherwise I'm out. <laughs> but so is a knife. The other thing among the most common and widely used multidimensional scales tapping loneliness are the UCLA loneliness scale. Cool. Which is University of California, LA. Los Angeles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Loneliness scale and uh, the Jean Gilveld uh, loneliness scale, but you can call it DJG. <laughs> DJG. DJG. <laughs> loneliness scale. <laughs> Wait, can we call it like DJG loneliness scale? <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. DJG loneliness scale. <laughs> <laughs> and it has questions like, how, so it kind of go by both inclusion and exclusion of loneliness. It's not like, do you feel lonely? Yes. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's less abrasive. Oh, that's good. It's um, how often do you feel that there are people who really understand you? Oh. And how often do you feel your relationships with others are not meaningful? And how often do you feel that you are no longer close to anyone? So those questionnaires might make you very sad because you're... They're making me sad. Because it's not a one question. It's actually you're go slowly going down I and know. down I, like, <laughs> to your own despair. The amount of time I would answer yes to those makes me sad. I'm going to have a really oh. hard time for the rest of this episode, Tali. I'm sorry. In the UCLA's loneliness scale, there are 20 items. Okay, 20 there, opportunities to feel bad about yourself. 20, 20 opportunities to make you feel like a failure. <laughs> and But there is a shorter version oh, of, of three items. So the three items is usually used for large scales. Okay, so that's what a lot of the surveys that the article was talking about use? Yeah, most of them use the, like uh, the UCLA. Short form. Uh, okay. bo both the 20, um, actually most use the 20 items, okay. but but some has used the short form. Okay. And the DJG, loneliness scale, which is the European one, uh, probes both emotional and social dimensions. So it asks things like, I experience a general sense of emptiness. <laughs> <laughs> You can't see this, but I'm making a really sad face. And Tolly's <laughs> laughing at my I'm sad laughing. face. I'm sorry, I've been reading so much about loneliness <laughs> that I feel like an emo kid. Uh, <laughs> I do sacrifice for you listeners. Um, and, and things like, there are enough people that I feel close to. So it's not only... How much is enough? Let's be real. I think that more than talking to a relative once a month. Oh, no. <laughs> so those are the social dimensions, whereas the emotional loneliness involves absence of intimate attachment, like a parent, a sibling, a close confidant. And social loneliness reflects on the community or social network, which is friends, co-workers and neighbors. Got it. Also, it does take into account both the quality and the quantity. That's great. And there are some parallels between the UCLA and the DDG. Loneliness scale. And so the UCLA is more of a global unidimensional contracts and the DJG. Loneliness scale. Is a multifaceted. Um, are these available to everyone to use or do you have to like have a license or pay for them? I think they are available online because I saw them online. But let me check. Okay. Because um, I think it would be really helpful to have yeah. at least one of them in the show notes. Yeah. I'll post a link to whatever uh, questionnaires there are. Do you want to talk about correlates and health effects of loneliness? Do I ever? <laughs> <laughs> Take you to the wonderful land of loneliness, Peter Pan. <laughs> <laughs> Yippee! <laughs> so there's a sizable literature, actually, about risk factors and loneliness Good. In older adults. I'm really glad to hear that. Especially in older adults. Cool. There was a meta-analysis synthesis of 218 studies that concluded that loneliness was associated with a constellation of both sociodemographic, psychological, and health-related risk factors that include being female, no. widowed, divorced, oh. never married, 
Not, which is basically not having a spouse. Yeah, not having a partner yeah. and being a lady. Having little contact with significant friends or low quality of friendship ties. Mm. Worsening physical health, like increased chronic illness and impaired mobility. Interesting. And lacking socioeconomic resources, which is limited education and low income. I believe it. Mm-hmm. Wow. At older ages, loneliness is also a major risk factor for broad-based morbidity, both psychological and physical. That's really sad. Yes. <laughs> I need a little break. <laughs> yeah, right. Beyond cross-sectional associations, loneliness has been shown to prospectively predict increased depressive symptoms, impaired cognition, dementia progression, significant likelihood of nursing home admission, and multiple disease outcomes. Okay, so like... Which is just, for example, hypertension, heart disease, and stroke. It's all set. It's just all the things are set now. (laughs) Yeah, I think we need more jokes. Want to hear a joke? Yeah. Knock, knock. Who's there? Nobody. You're going to die alone. (laughs) Oh my god! (laughs) Tully! That's the worst joke you could tell! Why would you do that? So funny. 70 articles from 1980 to 2014, featuring a total of more than 3 million participants, (laughs) found that after accounting for multiple covariants, like the age, gender, socioeconomic status, and all that, the increased likelihood of premature mortality was 26% for reported loneliness. 29 for social isolation and 32 for living alone. So it means that the more objective things of being alone are more about to kill you. (laughs) I'm just having a really hard time. (laughs) I think that I didn't go through the definitions in the end. What definitions? Yeah, we, of... we skipped the definitions of uh, like loneliness, solitude, and yeah, isolation. Yeah, because I, I don't know the difference. Yeah. Can I go back to them now? Sure. And loneliness is generally understood as a difference between a person's preferred and actual level of social contact. Oh, okay. So like you feel lonely when like you're not getting as much as you objectively want. or subjectively want. Yes. That's clever. Okay, cool. So, That's clear. So loneliness is subjective, and we need to distinguish it from living alone. Right, because I, I I know of people who live alone that are very active in their communities, mm-hmm. and they would rather not live with anyone else. Yeah, and loneliness and living alone are related but not overlapping. Good. I think that's a very important thing to, uh, to point out. And you said many people that live alone report very rich social life. Yeah. Solitude is... Actually, somebody choosing to not have contact. Okay. Okay. So, like, loneliness is a feeling you have when you have a need. Solitude is something you choose. Yeah. Okay. And social isolation, which is an objective state of having minimal social contact with other individuals. So... So solitude is by choice, and social isolation is either by choice or not by choice. Okay, so someone could be experiencing solitude and social isolation? Yes. Okay. Uh, somebody could also have both loneliness and social isolation. Yeah. Or just It's kind of like pain and nauseoception. Do we want to go down that rabbit hole? Uh, people do understand that it's uh, the difference between a subjective and, I see. and nauseoception, which is the actual, the actual electrical stimuli. Theoretical pathways linking loneliness and health. There are several theories that have been proposed to explain the health effect of loneliness in older adults. Okay. Loneliness has been found to associate with adverse health behaviors, like poorer health practices, like alcohol use and smoking, fewer health-promoting behaviors, less physical activity, poor nutrition, and all of them are more among older people than Uh, younger people. Okay. Additionally, loneliness is associated with diminished sleep. Really? Yes. You get shorter sleep duration, you get lower sleep uh, efficiency, and greater daytime fatigue in later adulthood. I already don't get enough sleep. (laughs) You're not lonely. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Cognitive processes have also been implicated as a potential mechanism in the loneliness-health relationship. Okay. Okay. For example, severe and persistent feelings of loneliness have been shown to impair executive function and heightened sensitivity to negative social stimuli. 
Wow. Yeah. Also erode interpersonal trust. Oh, well, yeah, that makes sense because yeah. you have fewer interactions. You kind of process and interpret everything as a threat. Okay. That, oh, man. That makes sense. They're talking right now in fMRIs about the sensory motor perception and mimicry abilities. Okay. Uh, like with loneliness? Yes. Like they're looking at fMRI of people with self-reported loneliness compared mm-hmm. to people who are similar without the loneliness? Yes. What are they finding? For example, loneliness is linked with reduced gray matter density in wow. the left posterior superior temporal sulcus. And the left posterior superior temporal sulcus is a region known to be involved in early stages of social perception, including eye gaze processing, hand action, and body movement coordination. Wow. Yeah. That's really interesting. It's an interesting article. I do recommend reading about, and if you do want and let us know, we can do an episode about loneliness and the brain structure. I think that'd be super interesting. Yeah. So just to sum that the whole mechanism segment, accumulating evidence suggests that adverse health behaviors, impaired sleep, biological Uh, dysregulation, negative social cognition, and regional brain activation to social and non-social stimulation may be among the key mechanisms underlying the effect of loneliness on broad-based morbidity and mortality. Want to talk about interventions? Snuggles. That's an intervention, right? It is an intervention. Aren't there like cuddle bars or something where you can just go and cuddle with someone? It sounds like the sleaziest place in New York City. <laughs> hey, do you want to come to the cuddle bar? Oh, it's, it's supposed to be like a platonic experience. Like it's very like consent based and they pretty much just go because they just want to cuddle. Yeah. I heard about that in Asia. Yeah, I... I think they had a pop-up in New York at one point. Did they? I think so. Are you talking about the guy in Union Square that says free hugs? No, that's different. <laughs> that's that's Sam. He is just a rando. But his hugs are nice. Hey, Sam. <laughs> Shout out to Sam. Listener of the show. <laughs> free hug man in Union Square. That's where it gets tricky. Turning to intervention studies, a key question is whether loneliness and social isolation can be alleviated among older persons whether it can yeah why can't it is it just because we don't know yeah because we don't know enough we barely know the mechanism in the brain we barely know what exactly happens it's hard to f- fight a monster that you can't see but or okay. know what it looks like so loneliness is the the feeling of not having enough social interaction to what you want Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't having more social interaction added to your life not be an intervention that could be useful? It could be. But again, because it's subjective and not the objective. I see. So it is a cure for social isolation, but not for loneliness. Okay. Masiral did a meta-analysis of 50 intervention studies. Wow. Okay. Okay. Twelve of them were single group pre pre and post uh, studies. Okay. Eighteen were non randomized group comparison studies. Okay. And only twenty were randomized. Okay. Okay. Within the twenty studies, ten included uh, adults age sixty years and older. As like their whole population. Mm-hmm. Okay. Six focused on adults in their middle age, and three focused on young adults. One included children. So we don't have that much research. So I'm really glad the UK is allocating multi-million pound for that. So is the job of this Ministry of Loneliness Mm -hmm. or the Minister of Loneliness, Ministress, Council of Loneliness to like fund this research? Like what is their, what are they doing? So right now they're... A, doing research involving both schools, businesses, hospitals, charities in targeting. You first need to target the objective. Yeah, true. The social isolation. They send school kids to have projects in the communities. Nice. They give money. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, listen, it works. Yeah. But that's just one example. Okay. And out of the meta-analysis of the randomized studies, it revealed that only a small size effect for interventions 
But compared to other interventions, those addressing deficits in social cognition had a larger uh, mean effect. Deficits in social cognition, like ability to pick up cues and things like that? Like like CBT. I see. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's what I have for now. I am very glad that we're targeting it now. We are very good at ignoring epidemics, and it really actually warmed my heart that the UK was the first government to say, oh, wait. We do need to put money into this because we are we are losing people to loneliness. And although loneliness is a great source of songs and <laughs> and pop culture, it's also a great source of disease and impaired function. Yes, impaired quality of life. So let's leave it to songs. Oh. And is that okay? That somewhere in my heart, I really wanted the minister name to be Pepper. Why? So it could be Sergeant Pepper Lonely Hearts. Stop it. <laughs> Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Council. <laughs> committee. Committee. Oh, man. Sergeant Pepper Lonely Heart Committee. <laughs> I wish. Do you have anything to add besides tears? <laughs> I'm so... Oh, this just hurts. <laughs> so I'm Tally Spaceman. I'm Aaron Carey. And this was Senoria Podcast. If you want to help us combat loneliness, you should really join the Facebook group. Facebook.com slash Senoria Project. If you want to get off the sidelines and get in on the action, you could be a game changer. And the way you find out how to do that is you go to SeniorIaProject.com slash Game Changers. These are people that help us with the direction of the podcast that get to hang out with us on our monthly meetups and are really awesome human beings who are an excellent resource. Yeah, you should be one. Feel free to write to us to ask for more, to ask for less. (laughs) Please stop making sad episodes. (laughs) And as always, stay stay funky. funky. Hit me. Thank you for listening to the Senior Rehab Podcast. If you only listen to these podcast episodes, you are missing out on 90% of the Senior Rehab Project. Hop on over to SeniorRehabProject.com where you can join the movement that's advancing care for older adults. You can join for free or become a part of the Game Changers where you can get some free gear and access to our monthly meetup. Just go to SeniorRehabProject.com. I appreciate y'all and I'll talk with you soon. But in the meantime, do not forget to stay funky.